Um, today, if you would, um, I guess John's in the back. Bill, can you put up Psalm 138, verse 1 and 2? While we were sitting there worshiping, I had this thought come to my mind. I'm just going to share it. It's not part of tonight's sermon, but I just want to share a little bit with you. I was thinking about witnessing, you know, amazing grace. And what if everybody we witness to out of love, not saying you're going down in the fire, all right, but out of love got saved? What if only half of them did? And you tell somebody, Jesus loves you. How about a quarter? How about one? Would it be worth sharing the message? That's how I see it, even if it's one. Um, m- most of the time, before you guys get a sermon, the guys at work have already heard it. Some of them are saved, some of them aren't. Um, it's just sharing the gospel, the word of God. But we're talking in Isaiah, and I, when I was praying, because uh, Tracy called me and said, you might need to teach. And then uh, yesterday he goes, can you teach? And I said, sure. And because uh, he said, John's on his way up from Texas. I go, okay, not a problem, I'll go ahead and teach. But I always look at the scripture like I'm there. How would this person feel, Isaiah, given the message, compared to how would Jonah feel given the message? Now, the Assyrians we find all through Scripture, even in Revelation, Damascus is still around. and um, So these names here we're pretty well familiar with, except for the kings and the times. And when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about, all right, Jonah, God goes, I want you to go to Syria. And I want you to tell them brutal people to repent. And everybody thinks that word's a dirty word. It's not a dirty word. Change the way you think. Turn to God. It's not that hard. And Jonah, what blows my mind, because he's a prophet, he knows God, he has a relationship with God, and decides, no, I don't like those people, so I ain't going to share the word. Because I serve a merciful God. But I, I always thought to myself, well, why would you get on a ship? I, I, I've never understood why Jonah got on a ship. I know I see the end of the story. But then I look at Isaiah. Israel's gone. They're conquered. We're now the last Judah. He's got a message to give. The difference in this message is the one Jonah gave. There's skin in the game. Because if Israel doesn't repent, I go into captive too. I thought, what a powerful message. A lot of us through this life have family, friends that aren't saved. We need to give the message to them. Because there is no salvation other than through Jesus Christ. And as I read this, it... You know, a lot of times I give these guys a break in the Old Testament because they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Christ is not yet crucified. But there were still godly men in the Old Testament. So even back then, every man and woman has a choice whether we're going to serve God or not. But some of the things God's been dealing with me is up here, Psalm 138, 1, and I want to, but I'll just read it here. It says, I will praise you. With my whole heart, this is King David, before the gods, so that's little gods, not real gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward you, your holy temple, and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. God's word you can take to the bank. Everything in this book is true. And God holds his name in such a high esteem, he holds it above Yahweh. And I think as Christians, we need to do the same thing. That when we're witnessing or when we're in the workplace, that only good conversation comes out of our mouth. That our word is, you can count on it. If I say I'm going to do something, we would do it. And the reason God brought this one up to me is because I got some bosses I like to call knuckleheads. And I think God's trying to tell me, you know, maybe you shouldn't share that. So when we see God, he's perfect. 
And I want you to think of his name. Because I believe Isaiah was worried about the name of the Lord. We're going to take a look at, we're going to go back a little bit, because Jim went through verse 7, uh, the first uh, chapter uh, 7 of Isaiah, 7 through uh, 17. But I'm going to pick it up to 17 again. But I want to take a look back so you get a background of how wicked this guy, King Ahab, is. And all the guys in Israel and Judah, um, he was probably the second worst. I think Manassas had him beat as a wicked king. This man did never seek the Lord, didn't want to hear from the Lord. Uh, Mezer, uh, married Jezebel, who's probably the most wicked woman that you can find in the scripture. And he didn't have a heart for God at all. Back in those days, a lot of times, if you were conquered by another country, a lot of times those people would start worshiping their gods because they believed their gods was more powerful than the God they served. Well, Yahweh is the only God. There is nobody more powerful than him. But I think one of Ahab's biggest problems, and it's something us Christians do, we don't always seek the Lord first. This clown never sought the Lord. But in our everyday life, do we actually seek God when we're making decisions? I can tell you, I don't. I don't. I don't always seek, seek God. But Ahab's seems to be prideful, spineless. Um, there's nothing good I can say about Ahab. Normally I can find something I can say, ah, you know, I can't find nothing good about this guy. And we're going to see it in Second Chronicles. But Second Chronicles chapter 28, verse 19, I'm going to read part of this. And it said, the Lord had humbled Judah because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he had promoted wickedness in Judah and had been most unfaithful to the Lord, Tigrath-Philsar, king of Assyria, came to him, but he gave him trouble instead of help. Ahaz took some of the things from the temple of the Lord and from the royal palace and from the officials and presented them to the king of Assyria, but that did not help him. In his time of trouble, King Ahaz became even more unfaithful to Yahweh offer sacrifice to the gods of Damascus who had defeated him. For he thought, since the gods of the king of Aram have helped them, I will serve them. In other words, Ahab bribed the king of Assyria for help. You'll find out real quickly the king didn't care. Now he's taken the treasure of the Lord out of the temple of the Lord, and he gives it over for a bribe. He relied on man. And too many times we rely on our flesh. Shouldn't happen. Or we rely on our own ability to make things happen. I call it trying to manipulate God. You ever pray for something and say, well, I'm going to help God out? I'm going to help God out. I want something. Now. I'm going to, you know, go along and help God out. And I find out I really mess things up when I try to help God out. If we pray for something, and the Bible says we pray according to his will, he hears us. And if we pray according to his will, he'll help us. But when we pray according to his will, but we want to manipulate him to do it my way, it seems like God's never into that. So over the years, I've learned that it's not my job to help God out. He knows what he's doing. But it is my job to be a witness. So here's Isaiah. He's called of God. Has approached a wicked king. And I thought, what would I want to do first? I'd like to grab the guy by the neck and slap him around. I don't want to go into captivity. I'm old. I don't want to. All I want you to do is to listen to Yahweh. That's all I want you to do for Isaiah. It'd be like approaching the president and say, look, dude, turn this nation back to God. And you want to say it. But instead, God wants us to pray about it. He wants us to seek him. He doesn't want us to venture too far away from his word. 
What I mean by that, pray something and then try to manipulate God into doing it. Uh, my younger days, I always thought, well, I'll help God out. And I always found that God never answered my prayers just exactly as I thought he would answer. And I'll give you an example, uh, uh, praying for my mom and dad for years before they were saved. My dad, uh, uh, when I'd call from the East Coast back, they didn't want to talk to me because all I'd talk about was Jesus. But when I came back one day, I witnessed to a guy in high school and uh, uh, prayed for him and his wife, and they both started attending church, and they both got saved. Well, my dad still didn't really want to hear from me. My mom really didn't want to hear from me because all my answers were Jesus, his word, tithe. Got to be involved in that. But how I saw God answer my prayer was simply this. I witnessed to a guy a few years ago through high school and junior high. He got born again. I go back to the East Coast, and he starts taking my dad to church, and then he gets saved going to church with my dad. I figured I'd be the one praying for my mom and dad, to be honest with you. I was the one praying for their salvation. So you don't know the lives that you influence, how it can come around and answer your prayers also. So don't give up on praying. Don't give up on reading. And God is true to his word. Problem is his word's about to come down on uh, Judah in a harsh way. But do you ever always notice, even when God does that, he's merciful? He's kind? You know, I thought, God, if Ahab did that to me, I'd zap that dude. Gone. Next. A couple, couple kings later, somebody would repent, you'd think. But uh, God doesn't work that way. He always seems to be merciful, slow to anger, abounding in love. I'm glad he's that way with me. So kid, uh, Jim left off in the 17th verse, but understand this is all one meeting with Isaiah. So I'm going to back up to 17 because I think it's really important to get 17 back in here. Um, it goes, the Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Hmm. Before that, he said, don't worry. Assyria will not invade right now. You don't have to worry about all the other ones wanting to invade. I'll take care of it. But God says there is a time of accountability. Assyria is coming. Not right now. But what God told him here is, there's not only accountability to Judah, the last two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, but he goes, your house and your father's house. And it's all for one simple thing. Ahaz refused to repent. And judgment's actually coming on this world to those that refuse to repent. I've never cared for Ahaz. Like I said, I've never in all my readings and studies have found anything worth mentioning his name for. His uh, wife Isabel was, or um, his wife Jezebel was uh, horrible. And these guys sought every way to provoke God to anger possible. The sacrifice of their babies on the fires of Molech served every god there was, killed the man for his vineyard, just the horrible things they do, but the mercy and slow anger of our God is something to say is truly amazing. And you think you would look back when you struggle through times, and if you're worried about your future, look what God's done in the past. God was always faithful to Israel, still faithful to Israel today, or they wouldn't be around. Um, he's always been faithful. But there's always seems to be only a remnant that hangs around. Everywhere. In the churches, in the world. You know, I get excited when I hear one person repent. Um, but God is so merciful and kind to us. And he deals with me just like he deals with anybody out there. I said, Dwayne, maybe you ought to be a little more careful of the words you use. 
because God holds his word so high. Maybe I ought to hold my words a little higher. And as a Christian, kind of get the standard of God that when I say something, I mean it. I promise something, I do it. I think it would be a, our churches would be a little better off if gossip didn't come out, anger, bitterness, strife, wrath. But Satan realized that he couldn't beat the church. He didn't join it. We are divided over some of the stupidest stuff you can ever imagine. I've talked to people, church splitting, because a girl went up and spoke from the pulpit. <sighs> really? And that's the kind of stuff I really have a hard time tolerating in the church, is that we don't walk in love. You know? Well, Dwayne doesn't speak as good as Jim. Correct, I'm not Jim. You know? Jim does a wonderful job with history. He does. I don't. But together, we're one body. And we've got to stop the cancer from running through our body. We've got to stop the cancer in the church of gossip, strife. How about unforgiveness? And I don't mean just this church. I meet a lot of people that got hurt at their previous church and won't even attend church or attend another church in another church. And I have so many times I counsel with people, and I try to let them know, okay, Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things. So what happened? God was involved in that circumstance to better you. How do we react in that circumstance? You know, I've uh, two guys were on Facebook, and they're, talking about a pastor and kind of beating him up. Well, if people knew this and people knew that. And I didn't have time. I was doing something. I thought, well, I'm going to reply. And I didn't find the post again. But what I want to reply was, if we know that all things work together for those that love God and call them for purpose, what I want to know is what was your reaction to what happened? Did you try to reconcile? Did you forgive? There's always two sides to every story. But as Christians, we should be slow to anger, bounding in love, easy to forgive, and our words should be true. Um, and that wasn't in my notes, so apparently God wanted me to speak it. So anyways, we're going to take a look. So we see God, Isaiah goes up to King Ahab and says, look. And I, I, I don't know how Isaiah keeps... His composure. This guy's a slime ball. I'm a prophet. I know what's going to happen to me if we go in captivity. I know that the judgment of God is going to hit here at home. And I still think he talked to Ahaz with respect. But he said, well, there's a problem coming. Those guys ain't going to invade you today. But he said they will. And when they do, there's accountability. Judgment starts in the house of God. For every single one of us here, there's accountability. Judgment starts in the house of God. We need to be accountable to one another. We need to be accountable for our words, our actions, our deeds. It's simple. Ahaz, on the other hand, would call on any small God because they're not real God. But he would not call out to Yahweh. The first place we should always cry out to is Jesus. The first place. If you got a problem with somebody, take it to the Lord. I found out in my prayer time when I'm talking to God, he's not dealing with my hurt feelings over somebody else. He's dealing with my heart. When you're praying with God, he's dealing with your heart. And he'll talk to you. And there's uh, putting this message together, really thinking how Isaiah would have took this. I'm like, I don't know if I should be kind. Dude, we're going to go in captivity unless you quit being stupid. That would be my words. Wake up because I don't want to go the same route you're going. Isaiah knew what was coming. But he remained faithful. He remained faithful to God. He remained faithful to his word. I think the church needs to get back to really simple reading the Bible. 
Why don't, why doesn't the church read the Bible? Why can't I go to a job site and find someone that was born again for, let's say, five years, and they never read the New Testament? Or only read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy, Pentateuch. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can understand how you can get real bogged down reading those books. I always point them to John. But as a church, we are to be salt and light, an example. And I think Isaiah does a fantastic job here being an example, showing respect to the office and what Ahaz holds. Yes, uh, Ahaz. Oh, Ahab. I keep saying Ahaz. Sorry. Ahab. Yeah, this same Ahab is the same one that went after Elijah in Kings, Second Kings. You can read on that too. Uh, Elijah had a lot of run-ins with Ahab and a lot of running in with uh, Jezebel throughout the history of this time. So now we're going to see here. I just want to show you what God says is going to come. And we see that we read in Second Chronicles when it did happen. That the man he paid off to help him sat back and watched. We cannot count on the flesh. We cannot count on people. But you can always count on God. And if God said it, it doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank. It doesn't matter who you buy off. Ahab bought off this king. And this king sat back and watched him get slaughtered. He couldn't call out to Yahweh now. That's over. We need to call out to Jesus, not to man. We need to read our Bible. The church is weak. It's hard to pick up the armor of God when you don't even know the purpose of the armor. The reason is called the armor of God. We need to pick up our prayer life and pray. So Isaiah goes on. He goes, in that day, the day of Yahweh, the judgment. Yahweh will whistle for flies from the Nile Delta in Egypt and for bees from the land of Assyria. They will all come and settle in the steep ravines and in the crevices in the rocks and all the thorn bushes and all the water holes. In that day, the Lord will use a razor. A razor was a mark of dishonor. Hired from beyond the Euphrates River. The king of Assyria to, sh to shave your head and your private parts and to cut off your beard also. God said, you relied on this man. You never sought me out. You relied on Assyria because of his power, because of his might, because of his gold. You gave him my objects in the house of the Lord. You never sought me. He goes, now watch what he's going to do. If you rely on worldly possessions, you're going to be in a world of hurt. I don't know about you, but friends are fleeting. You ever notice that when you find a real good brother or sister in Christ that they only seem to be in your life for a short amount of time? They're there for a purpose, to encourage you, to strengthen you, to help you. But it, God didn't send them away. And I get those phone calls. Brother, why don't you work with me no more? Because God wants you a light there, and he wants me a light here. But, you know, we don't get to hang out as much. Well, I, I agree with that. But we're called for a purpose. Every single person in this room is called for a purpose. God has a plan for you, but don't count on the riches of this world. Don't count on worldly people for help. And I'm going to be honest with you, don't count on other Christians. Count on the Lord. Seek Jesus, count on Jesus. Don't count on your bank account. I've seen people do that and walk away from the Lord. Don't count on other people. The only one that I found out in life that I can 100% count on all the time through my whole life has been Jesus. He said he would never leave me nor forsake me. He never has. But we need to understand that Ahab's actions caused his fall. People in the church, a lot of times when I counsel them, their actions
cause their problems, whatever they are. Credit cards. See what I'm saying? Ahab's actions causes his downfall. And it went deeper than that because he said it, and your household. You are an example to everybody in your household. You're an example to your kids, your grandkids, your neighbors. So I'm going to say be a good one. Be a good example. Even when they're not good to you. Does that make sense? Even when Dwayne hurts your feelings. You know, I've had people on job site go, well, you really upset me today. Honestly, I didn't know. And they'd come up and say, well, this is what you said. And I said, there was no anger, no intent. I just asked you to, I actually had a guy get upset because I told him to go ahead and do his job. And he thought I was mean. I said, sorry, I was in a hurry. But you got a job to do. I need you to do that job. Your actions, I want you to look at it another way, is your future. Does that make sense? If you don't receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're not going to heaven. That's your part. Not mine, not Jim's, not the church. If you're suffering from a lot of things because you don't forgive, that's on you. We have to be a forgiving people. Everything that happened to Ahab, he sowed the seeds that caused his destruction. In the church, most time when I counsel men, their seeds cause their own destruction, whether it's family, finances. I can't say, no, I got 14 credit cards, or, you know, my wife left, or blah, 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 blah. I've always seen a pattern. It's the same pattern time and time again. They don't know the Word of God, or they know it, and they won't apply it. And if you don't apply it, it doesn't help you. But the downfall of Ahab's family is caused by the action of Ahab. What if he would have repented of it? Even when he was getting attacked. He didn't. Your action, whatever man sows, also shall that man reap. I say this a lot. Words, deeds, finances, those are your seeds. If you don't like your harvest, change your seeds. Does not the Bible say your words are seeds? Jesus talked about the parable of throwing seeds. Your words are are seeds, your actions are seeds, your deeds are seeds, your finances are seeds. Put them in a good place. All right? That's one of the things I deal with a lot when I've counseled men over the years. Matter of fact, I was on the phone the other night from a guy from Texas for about two hours. The difference with me, with him, is he's not born again. And it's really hard to try to get the influence of God in his life by if you don't believe in God, then you don't believe in seed, time, and harvest. But God speaks a lot of seed, time, and harvest. If you want love in the household, what should you seed? Peace, patience, kindness, meekness, temperance, self-control. If you want to fight in your marriage, Anger, unforgiveness, bitterness. You will fight. You see what I'm talking about? Planting good seeds? Plant good seeds. Um, one I don't understand people is tithing. Years ago, my dad told me after he was saved, he said probably the best thing I ever showed him was tithing. And I remember dad came up to me one day and he said, Hey, boy. I go, What's up, dad? And he goes, I'm up to 8% tithing. I go, You know, dad, that's really good. But I go, wouldn't it stink if you got to heaven? God said, if I had 2% two more, two more, I could have blessed you. And dad goes, boy, that doesn't make no sense, does it? Well, by the t- time dad passed away, and he told me this uh, probably a year before he passed away, he said it was one of the greatest lessons I ever taught him because it set him free financially. I said, amen. We all have seeds to plant. But why don't we plant seeds of meekness, temperance, love, self-control? So 
but we sow sew those same, same things. God showed me a long time ago when I first got born again that my actions were seeds. That I found out if I yelled at people, guess what? Most of the time they yelled right back. But then I read a soft answer turns away wrath. So if someone's yelling at me, I said, well, how can I help? And I can guarantee you, I haven't had an instant on the job when someone's coming up to me yelling, screaming, and hollering, and I just take it calm and say, well, what can I do? How can I help you? That they just don't take a breath and say, sorry, bad day. But what happens if he's yelling at me if I turn around and yell at him? It escalates. So when God showed me, and he showed me this when I was a parts manager. I had a customer on the other side of the counter screaming at me. And I can feel my blood pressure going up, a little higher, a little. And I'm thinking about grabbing the guy, pulling him on my side of the counter. You know, I'm barely safe. And God starts speaking to me. And so I see that guy's lips doing this, but I don't want to hear a word coming out of his mouth. And God says, he's not mad at you personally. He's had a bad day. Always remember a soft answer turns away wrath. So about that time, God fades out, and his words come up, and he stops. And I said, well, I'm sorry. How can I help you? And I remember the shock on this man's face. He stopped. He looked down. He had his son right beside him. He knew he wasn't a good example to his son. He looked at me. He goes, I'm so sorry. You didn't deserve that. So that's okay. How can I help you? His car broke down. He was having a bad day. But I could have escalated that really quick. So understand, your words, your deeds, your actions are all seeds. Plant wisely. Here at Nahab, if he would have planted wisely, he wouldn't have went through destruction, him and his household. Ahab. I don't know. Ahaz? Ahaz. Okay. So I'm speaking about the wrong guy again, huh? Anyway, so let's go on. In that day, a person will keep alive a young sacrifice. What? That's the wrong one. A young cow and two goats. And because of the abundance of the milk they gave, give, they will be cursed to eat. Which means a lack of food. Israel's coming to a time. Judah's coming to a time. That it's a lack of food. Repentance would have went a long ways. Sometimes we just need to repent and say, God, please take these harsh feelings I have for so-and-so away from me. Don't worry about what they're praying. You pray, Father, help me forgive them who hurt me. And I'm going to be honest with you, that's probably one of the killers for women is the pain they carry on through life from some knucklehead saying something he shouldn't have said or doing something he shouldn't have done. But ask God to heal you from that. Give me that forgiveness for that person. Help me to love that person as you love that person, not as my flesh sees that person. Amen? Okay. And who remains in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day, in every place where there was a thousand vines worth of a thousand shekels, there will only be briars and thorns. Poverty. Do you understand poverty in the scripture is a curse? If I'm wrong, show me a blessing in poverty. It's always blown my mind why the priests in the Catholic Church swear a vow of poverty. I've never understood that. I'm like, so you're cursing yourself. I don't understand that. My, I don't look for riches and go. I look to be obedient to the word of God. That's all I try to do. But these guys now, a land flowing with milk and honey is going to be devastated. Hunters will go with their bow and arrow, for the land will be covered with briars and thorns. As for all the hills once cultivated by the hoe, you will no longer go there for fear of the briars and thorns. They will become places where cattle are turned loose and where sheep run. 
It has Manassas, all the kings you can mention in the Bible. Most of them weren't good kings. But if you ever paid attention to kings like King David, even though he was sinful, he made mistakes, but he knew how to repent and to worship. God was always faithful to forgive. As a church, if you don't like your harvest, change your seeds. It's not that difficult. If you don't know Jesus, repent. Say, Jesus, I want you, I need you. That's where it starts. In marriages, there needs to be forgiveness on a daily basis. Honestly. I know, there's sometimes I say things to Gaylene, I'm like, really? I worry about Dwayne. I love my wife. I do not abuse my wife. But sometimes, you know, men and women think differently, and I don't think the same way. So sometimes she's got to grab me and say, hey, knucklehead, can I talk to you for a minute? Sure. But we don't ever come together to fight. I don't know the last time we really fought. We come together to talk, not to fight. We learn to plant seeds of meekness, temperance, self-control, and love. What I'm telling you today is your downfall will be your own doing if you don't plant the right seeds. doesn't mean hard times are not going to come. Hard times are going to come. And when they do come, reach up and grab the hold of Jesus and hang on. He will take you through the roller coaster of life. You will have troubles and tribulations. Take heart because I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. You ever notice that uh, roller coaster ride? You go down, and then you're in the valley, and then you go up, and you, got, you can breathe, and then you go down again. That's kind of like your life. It's kind of like a roller coaster. But life becomes so much easier for a Christian when he's in the Word of God and he understands the Word of God, but mostly when he applies the Word of God to his life. You can have head knowledge, but not apply it. It will do you no good. We need to take the word of God. We need to take our prayer life, and we need to put them together. And when God tells us something, that's what we need to be doing. I told the guys at work, I go, it amazes me how many people say they're Christian but couldn't tell me nothing about the sword of the Spirit. And if this is called the sword, it's the only offensive weapon we have. Everything else is a defensive weapon. But if you're going to fight back, you better know a little bit of the word of the God. There's so many translations. I love the way Jim says it. He said, what translation is better for you? The one you read. Spend a little time in your word. Walk in love in your household, in the world, and be that example God's called you to be. Ahaz's downfall. It was Ahaz, right? Downfall, I'll get right sooner or later. Uh, His downfall was his own doing. The church's downfall is our own doing. Don't blame it on your spouse. Don't blame it on your neighbors. Look in the mirror and say, if my life's going to change, it's up to me. Years ago, I looked in in that mirror and didn't like what I saw looking back. I knew then something had to change. And it had to be the man looking back at me. Now I look in the mirror and I can smile. Because I like what's looking back at me. All right? So that's all I have for you. So we're going to go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much, Father God, for your word and for the examples we through, see throughout history, Father God, and throughout your word of godly people and ungodly people alike, Father God. Father, we just pray that your spirit be upon us, Father God, that you would help us, Father God, that when we do wrong, we would be quick to repent, slow to anger, easy to forgive, and to walk in love, Father. I ask that you bless everybody here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.